Thank you, Rodney. Um, I have to tell you a little bit about this. Uh, Rodney, uh, Professor Fry, uh, begged me several times and grabbed me on the campus one or two times last summer and said, I really would like you to participate in the, um, in, in the Turning of the Wheel uh, series. And I thought I really didn't have too much to contribute. I really, I looked at the website and appreciated very much what the, the series was about and had some difficulty thinking, well, what, what am I, what, what could I talk about? And um, I think the time he finally twisted my arm enough was it was a very lovely day on campus um, out here in front of the commons. And he just, he asked me, I looked around, I thought, you know, I bet you I could talk a little bit about this campus and how it might relate to this series, the idea that there are some universal things here and there are some that connect us with the larger uh, history of the world and there are some things here which are very unique. So um, I, I really am obliged to him for setting me on that path and giving me the opportunity to explore some things and learn some things that I didn't know about. This really isn't a historical overview in the sense that I'm talking about people and events that occurred in the making of the plan. What I'm going to try to do is um, talk a little bit about some of the things that I saw as reflected in the campus master plan that was produced by the Olmsted brothers and then move away from that and say what were some of the influences that may have created that and make my own inferences about how this campus might connect to my own experiences elsewhere or other places in the world. For a really strong, excellent historical document, it would be very important for you to read um, uh, Professor Meritus uh, Reese's article in the um, Idaho Magazine of several years ago. A, a wonderful document there that really um, describes the history of um, the Olmsted brothers. They're working here. They're in a relationship with the um, with, with the then president and how things really got started and, um, and just an excellent document. So I, I chose not to go that direction because I thought that story had been well written. My, the, the theme of it's called the University of Idaho Olmsted Brothers Master Plan, Historical Process and the Creation of Place. And I'm going to emphasize a bit more this creation of place and how it relates to historical events. Um, I started out by saying that this campus, and particularly what we call the admin lawn, are highly regarded by students, faculty, staff, and alumni as unique places and fond symbols of their tenure here at the university. This presentation will examine the design of the University of Idaho Master Plan in light of the Olmsted Brothers' contemporaneous work. In fact, the Olmsted Brothers were the, excuse me, the authors of the plan. Um, and then uh, the, their legacy from their father and stepfather, Frederick Law Olmsted, and then historic sites designed by others. And then highlighted here, by doing so, the presentation will demonstrate how well connected this campus is to other significant landscapes around the world, to ancient and modern concepts of place, and how our unique campus interplays with both ancient and modern concepts of universal place, in keeping with the theme of this uh, series. So when I get highlighted into the red, that's where I'm drawing a great deal of inference and observation from my own experience, my own understanding of place. And looking at our campus, or looking particularly at the admin lawn, the original sort of academia center there, designed by the old Olmsted brothers as, just, well really what does that mean and where might that have been borrowed from? So we're looking at uh, this, this lovely spot uh, here on campus. Um, known to many of us because we, uh, we choose to walk it uh, or we have to walk it, but certainly for students and faculty alike, it's really probably one of the most significant places. My overview will be in three parts, and over I'll be speaking uh, in three different sort of top parts. The, just a little bit about Frederick Gall Olmsted, his life and work, because I don't think we could talk about uh, the University of Idaho Master Plan uh, the University of Idaho, what, without putting it in the context of who this individual was, what he did, and what he stood for. And then the Olmsted brothers who succeeded um, their father and stepfather, uh, and some of the projects that they were working on that perhaps the same time they were doing this master plan, um, what they were, I'm sorry, I'm moving ahead here. Um, 
what they were working on and how that might have uh, related to what they did here. And then lastly, the historical origins. Um, and I put that in quotes because those are my own thoughts about what, uh, some, where some of these ideas may have come from or what they in fact relate to. And so I'm looking at the Idaho, as I call the concept plan because it's a very rough sketch and the University of Virginia master plan. What about Frederick Law Olmsted? Um, he was born 1822 and died in 1903. If we look at his life, we see that he was uh, first a seaman and uh, traveled uh, quite a bit and actually wrote a bit about the sailor's life and some of the uh, conditions that he saw. He was a farmer. He experimented in two different farms. He'd, his father uh, and mother had raised him in a rural life and valued the rural experience. And he was a very ideal logical, sort of idealistic farmer that I probably in some ways, uh, some of the, at least his first farm, probably wasn't terribly successful, but it was very beautiful. Uh, he was a writer and a journalist, um, wrote for the New York Times. And much of his work, uh, since he was working, is coming into his uh, prime, uh, his middle age there um, during the Civil War. He, he really was able to uh, observe the whole issue of slavery and what it meant to this country from an economic as well as a social justice perspective and wrote about it. And then it was a park superintendent of the city of New York and ultimately landscape architect and with his English architect colleague, Calvert Vox, a co-designer of Central Park in New York City. And I think it was just a marvelous thing that you could be the superintendent of the parks and design the plan and win it. I don't think we could do that today, but anyway. Um, he also invented, or the, the term landscape architect really is often credited to him, but um, I learned that it also developed, um, there are other opinions about it having been created by others in England. But I will say that one of the terms he thought might be important in his association with Andrew Jackson Downing, who was a renowned landscape designer, died tragically very young. He had this notion about calling the profession of landscape architecture profession of rural embellishment. And I'm really glad that he chose to call what he did uh, landscape architecture. But some of his books, some of his articles, he wrote many, many articles, kept extensive journals. Uh, one of his first ones was Walks and Talk of American Farmer in England as a, as a um, fairly young man in his early 30s, um, visiting uh, different parks and landscapes of England and Europe. Um, a, um, journey down in through Texas where he was looking and commenting on some of the journeyman settlement down in the San Antonio area. And then also Journeys in Exploration, the Cotton Kingdom, which really was a, um, a very critical analysis of the um, condition of slavery in the South and ultimately led him to become an abolitionist. He wasn't originally, he had one of these sort of very comfortable and notions that sometimes we fail, we, we fall into, well, we don't know enough about it. But this certainly, um, in his, his journeys throughout the South, uh, led him to write a very significant piece. And so before he ever did anything with Central Park, he was a was very reflective individual, very much a scholar, who was you know, writing and commenting and thinking about the future of the, um, our country um, and it's a very, very difficult time. So incredibly unique person. So when we look at this um, campus plan, when we walk the admin lawn, we walk across the hello walk, all those things followed him. But in many ways, I wonder if they, we would have had what we had up there if this individual, Mr. Frederick Olmsted, had not appeared and not had his values uh, as he had them. So this is a picture of him as a fairly young man going to sea and traveling. Um, quite stylish, I think. Um, quite uh, impressed with himself, it looks like. To me, I shouldn't infer that, but that's quite an outfit. Um, then, uh, I think this is probably the, the most um, common picture, one of the nicest pictures of Frederick Olmsted as, a, as he got into middle age. And um, I think that looks like a, some kind of a beaver fur collar or something there. He was working out in California as well as in the West and, and the rest of the country. Um, you know, working on such things even, the, even as presenting rationale to the federal government for the founding of Yosemite uh, Park. Um, but certainly um, a very gracious individual who um, in every way tried to 
uh, learn as much as he could and, and um, bring it into his personal life and his own career. And then this is a um, famous painting of him in his older age um, by John, the painter John Singer Sargent. I believe that's how you say his middle name. And um, certainly you can see that his forehead has come forward quite a bit and um, he's wearing a cane, but um, you know, the, I believe this was done in Franklin Park actually up in the Boston area. But a very, uh, certainly a man that um, uh, worked very hard and experienced a great deal. And I think these images of him certainly convey his character and spirit. It'd be very important to mention Calvert Vox, who I believe he learned a great deal from. And Calvert was an English architect that had come and um, he met and worked. Calvert also worked with Andrew Jackson Downing, who was a, um, a very uh, well-documented, well-written landscape designer of the day. He was writing books about architecture and landscape design and what should be the standards and models for communities even. And he met Calvert Vox through um, <clears throat> Andrew Jackson Downing. And uh, he and Calvert were, the, of course, the co-designers of Central Park. In his journeys and travels to Europe, I saw many things, and he was um, um, very much influenced by Birkenhead. And this is an early drawing of Birkenhead Park near Liverpool, England, and he, uh, known as the People's Park, a, a public park. And that, in many ways, solidified his perceptions of what parks should be and the role that parks played in um, creating you know, responsible use of space for everyone is opposed for the wealthy and the elite. And here you can see today just a diagram of it, the characteristic curving picturesque walkways and promenades that were created um, uh, for you know, people to stroll about. You can see in this little analytical drawing um, uh, just kind of how the, the park remains even today. And some of the images from um, Birkenhead. So we get a, if we start looking at his work and we see his work further along, we, these images from these very picturesque landscapes, English landscape, um, influence his, his work and influence his, his design attempts. The, um, we just have a hard time finding a good drawing of the park, but this is their submission for um, Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted's plan for uh, Central Park. And we can see in it the elements that were common to Birkenhead. The, again, the carriage roads, the curving walkways, the sort of imagined fantasy, natural landscape, all of those things are contrived. They weren't there, but they were very definitely a, a designed experience, something that he wanted people to feel um, as, as, as a result of his experiencing other parks. And today we recognize <clears throat> you know, Central Park as this very, very valuable piece of real estate um, in New York City. Obviously, the placement of open space anywhere increases the value of, of real estate and the landscape. And um, so it remains as one of the mo most unique parks. And yet, as you look at its history, you recognize that someone like Frederick Olmsted had to use all of his skills, his facilitative skills, his political views, his uh, stubbornness to really make this happen with Calvert Vox. And, um, because there were all kinds of ideas about what should happen, New York being this melting pot of many cultures. You had, you had for example, there was an Irish um, man who was a councilman who was very much objective to these curving paths because he felt they looked like the classic picturesque landscape. And of course, when you look at the history of the, the Capability Brown and all of those designers who built you know, these thousands and thousands of acres of parks for the wealthy, where in fact villages were um, eliminated to build these things, you can understand why in fact the park might have that type of symbolism to someone who was from Ireland. One of his most significant um, parks in my mind uh, that he did again with Calvert Vox was the Prospect Park. I, I even like it more, but that's just a personal preference. And this also has a very significant relationship to the University of Idaho of recent days in that um, Christian Zimmerman, who graduated from the University of Idaho in 1982, um, has won several awards for his work in restoring Prospect Park. 
So the circle kind of comes around again. We find this very significant landscape being stewarded and nurtured and undertaken and restored by one of our graduates here from the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Idaho. But, a, but uh, just a very bucolic in the city type of landscape. Um, as he moved along, he, he was, became a close friend with uh, Senator Morrill from Vermont, who was really pushing for the um, completion of the Capitol grounds. And we um, look at this image and we can see the um, sort of the, what really we would almost consider Beaux-Arts character of this. Um, very gracious circling parkways, um, the use of the strong diagonal, you know, inferences from everything that he had experienced, but also Andrew Jackson Downing had died by him, and I think he also was really giving tribute to uh, Andrew Jackson Downing in this wonderful plan for the Capitol. One thing that I found out that I didn't know before, uh, that he actually, um, like a lot of landscape architects, they decide they should play around with the architecture. <clears throat> and um, he actually recommended and was done this, the Capitol building was raised on a very large terrace, a plateau if you will, and that was part of how in fact the, the reconciliation of the, the landscape was, um, was done here for Capitol. Perhaps the, one of the m most significant pieces, and particularly as we think of today, in our concerns for stormwater management and wetlands restoration, green infrastructure, sustainable design, or the circle of energy and how we use resources and how we re-nurture our landscape and so on and so forth. This is the Emerald Necklace. I won't go into it very much, but it was really um, a series of continuous parks that went throughout the Boston area, but also dealt with how um, stormwater was managed and uh, throughout the city. And so you had this combination of design for the purpose of human access, but also for uh, controlling and, and managing stormwater. So we had, um, when we look at his work, we, he designed, also designed over 30 university and college campuses, including Yale, Cornell, and Stanford. And this is an image, just an early sketch of, uh, from his office of Stanford. And as I said, he also, became involved in, in uh, partnering with many for the preservation of wilderness areas. And this is actually from Olmstead Point in, in, in uh, Yosemite um, Park in California. And um, he was w very much wrote uh, for the preservation of this area and worked through a very difficult period of his life in trying to um, get this thing going, working with others. Um, if, you, if you read his journals, it was one of the most agonizing periods that he had to go through given uh, some of the challenges politically and economically. He also designed McLean Sanitarium early on in his life. And um, this is where he also died. He, was, he, he did go. They think he probably had some version of Alzheimer's, but he became very depressed and um, towards the end, very forgetful. And he was, in fact, um, uh, this, these spent his last days here at, the, at this hospital, at the sanitarium. I thought it was quite interesting. I never knew this, but he said, he got there and he said, you know, they're not taking care of the bushes the way I planted or the shrubs the way I wanted them. So I think that's always the, the, one of the concerns that the designer, the landscape architect might have is, how is something maintained? How does it move into the future? And he certainly was a little discouraged that some of his original ideas had not been followed, but they say that the maintainer, the gardener, is the most significant designer of any landscape. Okay, so we leave him there, uh, passing away, and the firm, as he got older, the firm really was turned over to his sons, um, the, John Olmsted, his one stepson, and then his boy, who was originally known as Henry Perkins Olmsted, they rechristened him, I think, when he was eight as Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. I thought that was just a bit of a tickle. And um, Henry Perkins uh, was a, a notable individual, someone he was very, had a great deal of admiration for. But um, I just think that's interesting. He went so far as to rename his son at some point. Um, the firm, this firm uh, was a successor to the earlier firm of Olmsted, and then Olmsted, Olmsted, and Elliot, and um, John Elliot, Charles Elliot, excuse me, uh, joined the firm, but again, like 
Andrew Jackson Downing died very young, and so um, the, um, Charles Eliot was a partner for a while. Of course, Charles Eliot's father was the first president of, um, or uh, the president, excuse me, of Harvard University. So these two brothers, Frederick Olmsted uh, Jr. and John Olmsted, were essentially the, uh, the brothers were of the main uh, players in this firm, and um, their work, they were the ones that were involved in uh, designing the uh, concept plan and ultimately the um, layout plans for portion here of the campus that we know as the admin lawn. They, um, they also were the founding members of the American Society of Landscape Architects and continued, like their father, to play a very influential role in the National Park Service. Um, the firm was considered large, 60 people, um, and, um, and it was in, in the early 30s. So it continued, actually, I think, continued. One of the members was still living until 1957, I believe. Uh, they did have a sister, Marion, who also was involved, which I didn't know about. So I think that's great that all of the, here were they all, the sons and the daughter even followed in their father's footstep. I have two sons. One of them is languishing in Seattle looking for work as a landscape architect because, well, he's not really, he's really busting uh, his can to try to keep going. Um, but there are, no, there are no jobs in landscape architecture right now, probably not in the Seattle area. He should move. Everybody wants to live there. But he, um, so he's working for an architect part-time. He works for the University of Washington bookstore. And he also gets up five days a week and prepares sandwiches for some, you know, chain. I forget what the name of it is. But um, he's, he's working hard. You've got to pay down that debt, you know. And uh, my other son, uh, Joshua, is uh, in U.S. Park Service, um, Mount Rainier, as the conservation restoration horticulturalist. Which So I, I, um, I don't compare myself to Olmstead, but I, this does happen. Sometimes your, your uh, sons or your daughters follow mm -hmm. and do things somewhat similar to what you're doing. Um, okay, let's talk about where we are out here. Um, John Olmsted, Charles Olmsted, he was making several trips out west to oversee projects in Seattle, and we'll talk about Seattle a bit, and elsewhere. He was hired by the city of Spokane, and with his firm issued a report in 1908 proposing four large new parks, five smaller local parks, 11 play fields, um, several parkways, and major, major improvements to 10 existing parks. And by 1913, the city had multiplied its park acreage tenfold. So when he, he did the design for, when the firm did the design for University of Idaho, they were engaged there as well. And many of Spokane's well-known public places, the Finch Arboretum Highbridge Park, Down River Park, which I just found this past year working on a project up there, they owe their existence to this Olmsted report. And even pre-existing parks, including Manitou, Oh, much of their aesthetic appeal to Olmsted suggestions. Um, John saw that the city would one day reclaim the downtown waterfront, um, uh, which became the Riverfront Park in 1974, and Sp Spokane park planners and civic activists still looked to the Olmsted report for guidance. This is a professional photographer's image of Finch Arboretum. And here's the USGS map of the Down River Park, which occurs in the um, the Spokane River on the um, to the west to the west of the city. Really, an amazing place. I really hadn't experienced it until this summer. But certainly, a major impact there. And then, which I think is really significant too, the firm worked in Seattle for 34 years, had projects ongoing in the Seattle area that long, <coughs> designing 37 parks and playgrounds, including Coleman, Frank, Green Lake, Interlock, and so on and so forth, Washington Park and the Arboretum Woodlands Park, as well as Lincoln Park and the Ravenna Boulevards. The note is made that park planners across the country recognize Seattle's Olmsted Park systems um, as one of the mo best preserved and best designed in the United States. Most importantly, while many eastern cities have only one or two, Seattle has an extensive multi-plan park system. And they're continually looking at that and thinking about how, in fact, those park systems are linked by water systems. And you really, as you look at work today in Seattle, you may not experience the linkages that were created by the Olmsted brothers. Uh, but certainly the intent to continue those and rebuild those is um, at the heart of a lot of 
capital planning in, in the Seattle area. This is the, uh, the Washington Arboretum, uh, uh, you know, incredible space there in, in Seattle and the University of Washington. Um, also, they were um, credited for their work with the Capitol, Washington State Capitol in Olympia. And um, this, I didn't find a very good plan, um, but this is actually a plan by Methuen Architects looking at the restoration of the um, Olmstead plan and the ex and expansion of it in anticipation of existing needs. So you can see that we again have that sort of very um, classical look, the use of the, di the diagonal as a way to move people through and bring people to the center of the space. Uh, one of the most significant pieces that I ex enjoyed for many years um, on and off was the Cleveland Metro Park system. One of the largest, you know, prior to Chicago, really, where m large areas of open space and woodland were preserved as somewhat of a ring around the city. Again, this idea of what we call green infrastructure today or green linking of, of space so we can have the uh, continuous movement of, of habitat or we can bring ecosystems together. Um, in this case, just really looking at how to provide a, a larger park system that was linked to communities uh, throughout uh, Cleveland. Um, so what do, what, what do we see happening with the Olmstead Brothers? I think we see a definite emphasis on park systems, but we also see that their work is larger in embracing land planning and recreation at a very large scale. This indeed is the history of landscape architecture from the end of the 19th century, the turn of the century. You see the city, as cities began to grow and park systems were needed that um, at the same time as we had wilderness available, that people like the Olmstead brothers were very interested in connectivity and um, trying to create a linkage. And much of what I think we owe in many of our big cities to the, the existence of park systems as a result of their emphasis on that concept. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can probably read this, but this is the letter that John Olmstead wrote to um, um, President, uh, then President, um, always forget, McLean, sorry. And um, it's just a letter where he's talking about, well, I think we can work on the University of Idaho project. We're working in Spokane right now. We're working on a, we're also working on the Alaska Union Pacific Exposition Company and that um, I'll probably have an occasion to go down to the Pacific Coast early in March. I have only a very vague, what is it, how long, how, how long I can be there, but I wish, should su suppose it would take me about a month between the time of uh, crossing the Rocky Mountains going west and that of crossing uh, um, on the way east. So if, if you'd still like me to come visit the University of Idaho, I'd be happy to do that and give you some ideas of, about what, how we might improve the campus and give you some advice um, and so on and so forth. Kindly let me know. Then he talks a little bit about how much it would cost and so on and so forth. So this is a letter in 1907. Yes, 1907, um, in response to a letter from President, then President of the University of Idaho, McLean, that documents um, John Olmsted's uh, initiation of working with this campus. And ultimately, you know, we have drawings like, let me see, this next thing's going to take a while. Hmm. That's not going to come up. Ultimately, our campus plan, that, you know, evolved in this area. Um, we have the administration building here in the center and then we, we, um, we see the, the proposed road and um, the, uh, the, you know, the preservation of, of this space. But the concept drawing that was submitted, which is very interesting, is, is very different. And um, Nels probably knows really more about this and maybe he did it originally kind of on the back of a napkin. I don't know, it looks like that kind of a drawing, doesn't it? But it's, it, it is, it's a drawing of someone that probably hadn't, may not even have visited here yet. I wonder if he'd actually come. Do you know when he did this? I think he'd had he had been, been here. here. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was here. Very um, long. Maybe a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. I think this came probably on the train ride. I think so, yeah. It's like, oh, Seattle. ah, and, um, Yes, I think so, because it really, this was never implemented. We have at the top the administration building, uh, which was uh, you know, new and rebuilt from the fire. And then we have this expansion to the east, and um, the proposal for the um, 
developing the really what is very similar to um, um, well, I'll go ahead. Very similar to um, the University of Virginia's uh, academic village or academical village. So this is where I want to talk a little bit about the plan, this concept drawing, this back of the napkin, shall we say, idea that is so interesting. Um, and the University of Virginia master plan. So what are some of the uh, historical connections that we have here? What were some of the possible inspirations that I don't think Olmsted necessarily saw about, but what are the connect what's the connection between this idea and, and the greater history? And then what does this all have to do with the making of place? So I'm going to step back here, look at an early um, uh, a lithograph of, um, of the academical village that was at the University of Virginia as proposed by uh, Jefferson and his architect. And the idea was that you would have a rotunda image uh, sitting in the center and then classrooms as well as faculty housing surrounding this large common green. All, you know, thinking about maybe the rotundas, the head and the arms, uh, the buildings with the students and all as the, as the arms of the space and the, maybe the open space there being really for the exchange of ideas as well as for recreation. So we can see, you know, back and forth that in fact, there is a relationship between this plan and what uh, John Olmsted proposed. Um, as I said, ultimately it wasn't done. The university didn't purchase the land. It didn't move in this direction. The different pressures, different needs, I think, uh, changed the direction, including the fact that we had um, you know, the athletics and agriculture moving more towards the west. But certainly an interesting concept and an idea, and this is a, a more of an engineered drawing of, of the uh, academical village at the University of Virginia um, by Jefferson's uh, in, uh, architect. And you can see that, that idea of how the buildings essentially function around this square. And there, in fact, is the, um, the image of the building. Today you can see the, the older buildings along the side and the rotunda there at the head. And this rotunda, of course, is, uh, is the head, and it's part of a uh, very significant part of the plan because um, Jefferson was very much influenced by the work of Platio, and this is uh, a side view of um, Villa Rotunda um, in, the, in the Veneto region of Italy. I happened to be able to be there for the first time this summer. And this is uh, Villa Malcontenta, and I forget the name of theirs. Actually, it has another name to it, a family name. And for those of you who are architecture faculty or were the, the dean of the uh, College of, Agric of Architecture in Venice, this is his home, too. So anyway, um, yeah. Huh? Yeah, too, too bad, guy. poor guy. Um, but um, we can see the influence that these, these uh, buildings had on, on um, Jefferson's uh, Monticello, and I think subsequently on the Rotunda. So going back to our plan again, let's talk about some other things. This is a very bad slide, and I apologize for it. Um, but the idea of the Agora, the Greek Agora, we see this, whether we look at the Roman Forum or whether we look at something like the Agora, we can go back in time and see that they're very real similarities between this idea and the idea that Jefferson created. Whether he was referencing this, I don't know, but I do know that we can see continuity and historical reference. Or whether we look at, you know, the concept of the cloister, the Abbey cloister, um, or even something bigger here like Salisbury, the a garth, which was a very large area of lawn. We see that this type of enclosed open space developed throughout the medieval uh, period uh, is a very substantive part. I was actually visiting a, a cloister in southern France once and understood that it was designed so that someone could do a full um, rosary as they went around the four sides. So it was, you could pace yourself and, and do one set of prayers as you went around. Um, very, very interesting kind of association. But what does all this really kind of have to do with us? We come back here to uh, the Palouse. 
and uh, you know our very uh, wonderful landscape that is a result of volcanic loess blowing in here, um, creating these wonderful hill forms and these land forms. <coughs> And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go back a little farther because I'm really getting into this. And um, whether or not it's here or not, I, I, this is where I jump off the deep end. But I think that there is an interesting association. Maybe you can't see that very well. But that's a, an entrance to a, a Tuscan tomb in Tuscany. And um, there are several of them left. Um, they were, depending on how wealthy you were, they were extremely large or small, or they were highly decorated or very simple. But essentially, the Etruscan tomb uh, was, uh, was and very similar to other cultures, was the, was the emphasis on carrying forward uh, your, um, your, your, your wealth or provisions into the, uh, the next life. And so you, a great deal of emphasis placed upon these. And this is just a, one that shows the entrance that's been dug out. Um, but there's a very interesting association here. Um, this is from a little book by the former head of the Minnesota School of Design Architecture, and I can't think of his name. I couldn't find the book. So I, I do apologize to him and to you, but I will give him credit. This is an interesting sequence of images that kind of talks about this rotunda. And at the top, there we have the, um, the Etruscan tomb. And typically, trees, cedars and all, were planted on top because they spoke of life. So when the Emperor Hadrian had his tomb built in Rome, it was really essentially an extended, large-scale Etruscan tomb with the trees planted on top. And then as we come down here, we, we can see here at the bottom, we can see the interior and the, and the dome, the beginning of the rotunda. So this is what it looks like today. The earthen mound is gone from the top as well as the trees. It's a museum uh, along the Tiber River there. But then we look at the tomb of Augustus. It's similar, very similar. That's in Rome as well. And you can see that on the upper left there, it was a, again, there was the earth mound over a series of catacombs or a series of rooms that housed the bodies of the, of the Emperor Augustus family. Um, this is it today, you know, very lovely kind of space. I, th I hope that wire is gone, but I, I like coming to this part of Rome and seeing this whole thing. At one point in time, it was used as a theater, but it's nice to see it still has the trees and things growing on it. There's the, um, there's looking at it again from one side, sort of an abandoned thing. And then um, we have the Pantheon, which is, it's not too difficult to make the jump from the tomb to the design of the Pantheon, some 2,000 years old. And the dome is on the top and with the oculus in the center that essentially Certain is able to go around, and the sun is able to point to the different gods that are in the pantheon. And uh, the only people that weren't in there were the Christians, but they won anyway. Um, the, uh, but this you know, wonderful oculus bringing in um, a great deal of light. And then we can go and we can see that this was used for Jefferson's monument in Washington, D.C., we see that people do the same thing. They look up at this ceiling, at this dome, and take a look at the coffered ceiling, not too dissimilar from the coffered ceiling at the Pantheon, but certainly their heads are raised and drawn to the circle at the top. There's no oculus here. Then we go back, and there's, there's that rotunda again. So I, my, my point to make is that this plan not only goes not only talks a little bit about how, you know, um, Olmsted, John Olmsted organized this original concept, but it was part of um, a larger idea that Jefferson had in creating the University of Virginia Academical Village, as he called it. But that is part of another evolution of ideas, the whole evolution of the rotunda and the dome 
And so we don't see that when we go outside. When we walk the admin lawn, we don't see the dome there. We don't see uh, anything that really looks like that. But I think that this points out that how design evolves and ideas evolve, that spaces are latent with, with, um, with ideas from the past that may not be explicit. They may not be experienced, but as you learn about them, you can see how ideas develop. And so we, didn't, we don't really have, you know, in this plan, we don't have our rotunda. Um, but we do have the, the plan for the academical village. And this was what occurred in the Moscow Mirror. This is from uh, the um, wonderful book, Beacon on the Hill, written by um, Rafe Gibbs, I believe, the author. And he's, this was in the Moscow Mirror on 1889, talking about the siting of the campus. Probably a more sightly location could not be found in Idaho, nor one that can be successfully ornamented with trees and shrubbery. The location is level except the slope necessary for drainage, and although by no means a high piece of ground, is sufficiently elevated to command a perfect view of paradise. And it goes on and on. So I, I would like to conjecture. I think that you know, we are in a, in a very lovely part of the world, and um, it's very much part of this place where we, this, the sense of place that we have about this campus you know, relates to our surroundings, to our bioregion, but it also has something to do with the early thoughts that people like Olmsted had or McLean, the president, or others that developed and thought about the design of this campus. It really wasn't a full-blown master plan. It was a seed that um, really drew upon, I think, the strength, the visual character of our own agricultural landscape here, but reached back in time and was built on other concepts of space and, and architecture. And oh, by the way, we did get our rotunda, our rotunda finally. Um, I guess that might count. But um, I don't know that putting the rotunda in was the architect's fulfillment of the Olmsted plan. I doubt very much it was. But I, I kind of like to see that circle that Rodney talks about kind of coming around, that when we look at something it reaches way into the past, that the icons, the forms, the, the thoughts, the creativity that goes into it isn't just a response to place as it looks, but it's bringing forward a lot of, of experience that the designer might have had and in conversation with others may develop something which is a very good seed and allows this campus to grow and, and move forward. I'd like to thank the University of Idaho Library Archives and the Fairstead Frederick Olmsted National Historic Site Archives, as well as Joshua Hale, uh, one of our Master of Landscape Architecture students who helped me gather uh, information. Some references that I used, Beacon for Mountain and Plain, the story of University of Idaho by Rafe Gibbs. I was able to pick up a very good volume of that just before um, Mr. Green got out of the business of uh, book people an excellent book about the history of the university. Um, Frederick Olmsted, Volume 3, The History of Creating Central Park, very informative. The Genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Olmsted, Abolitionist, <coughs> Conservationist, and Designer of Central Park by Justin Martin, and probably one of the best that spans not only Olmsted's life, but also talks a lot about the Olmsted brothers, is A Clearing in the Distance by Vitold Rybczynski. Um, I believe he's at the University of McGill, isn't he, at Montreal? He's written uh, quite a bit, very successful. So thank you very much. <laughs> Are any, anybody have any questions? Yes. Question: the, As you look at some of the uh, malls that were created, Virginia, uh, Morrison National Mall, yes, our own uh, attempt at here, a mall. Mm -hmm. and I was even now thinking about a modern mall that we have uh, down in uh, California. But 
Have you thought at all about how those, most every one of those malls got closed off? In other words, you... The terminus was there. You the, talked about the view the, to yeah. the paradise. Right. And in Virginia's case... There's always a, a terminus. A white foot and a building at in the very end. And, right. But it wasn't and there originally, was it? No, we, music building was put in, yes. Had, had the music building not been built, we could look Kept on right going, down yeah. out across yeah, toward yeah. the... the I didn't think about that, Nels. That's really important, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know if you... No, I think that's a very good point. That ever, uh, contemplated that, but it's an interesting issue. And yeah. with Salk's building down in uh, California, they fought, they fought the whole United States architectural profession to not about whether they could yeah. close off that mall. Yeah, yeah. And once again, the mall at one time was open up to the mm -hmm. Pacific, and it opened up, in a sense, to the grandeur of the Pacific. Yeah. And now they have put a building in yeah. the way there, so we can't have a. Well, big I guess isn't there always a? There always seems to be that signature piece. The you know every access needs a terminus, doesn't it? And I think whether it's something that interrupts the view or closes off the view. It seems to be a natural tendency. We ultimately, as culture, we want to close that, don't we? Some yeah, I don't know whether to be uh, totally angry about it or not, but it does uh, uh, sort yeah. of close the door to does continue paradise. paradise yeah, it does. It's a very good point. Thank you. I didn't get that far. No. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you.